Every meal you eat causes inflammation. Like that's a very normal response. And actually to me it makes perfect sense because when you're eating, you're exposing your body to the outside environment. Uh, because obviously the gut is directly connected to the outside environment, right? So you're basically a, like an inside, like an inner tube, right? You sort of like go in and out all the way around. Right. Um, and so you're exposing yourself to the outside environment and then you're activating the immune system to be able to deal with whatever might come in. So um, when you have these endotoxins coming across, you sort of amplify that response and you see an increase in inflammation, but then you also see an increase in insulin, resi in insulin release. And we talk a lot about insulin and metabolic health. So all of that is part of this coordinated response. And obviously the more endotoxins you have coming over, the more insulin you have coming in, the inflammation itself causes higher, higher insulin, we know because you're causing insulin resistance, but at the same time, the body is releasing insulin to divert nutrients to the immune system to try and deal with the bugs going on. So you kind of have this feed forward cycle where you have more insulin, more insulin resistance. Hello friends, it's Mike here with High Intensity Health. Thanks for tuning back into another video. I'm super excited to be here with my friend, Dr. Tommy Wood. We're gonna talk about the microbiome and how, how high fat diets can affect your microbiome and cause you to maybe hit a wall if you're in nutritional ketosis and not benefiting uh, from how maybe you were benefiting. We're gonna talk about the gut and ketogenic diet applications for athletes and much more. Dr. Wood, thanks for, so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. We can talk about all the weight loss benefits attributed to nutritional ketosis, right? But there's some, this variable where fat is going, the microbiome, and if you, yeah. you, you were mentioning offline, if you have low bifidobacterium or high proteobacteria and having a lot of fatty coffee and, and all this, we can add fuel to the fire, right, yeah. in terms of inflammation. So maybe let's first start off with a little, let, let get the context understood. You know, a lot of clients that, that work with you, keto works well for a while and then they kind of hit a roadblock. And so let's talk about that. Yeah, so this is something that we've been seeing more and more. So we spend a lot of time in, in like the keto, uh, low carb space. Yeah. And then when you talk to people, they, they always have this story, which is low carb keto works really well for me to start with, but, and there's always a but, and it's maybe their fasting insulin or fasting glucose hasn't come down, or their mood hasn't improved the way they wanted it to, you know, or their weight loss has stalled or something like that. So, you know, people do really well to begin with. And then, you know, so the people who are really popular and big in the low carb space, they're working with these people at the start, you see great benefit to begin with. Mm -hmm. But then when things start to go wrong, it's always like you reach out to the traditional keto people and they're like, well, you're just doing it wrong. Anything that does improve insulin resistance does seem to improve the health of the gut. Mm -hmm. So when you're cutting out carbohydrates from the diet of somebody who is insulin resistant, you're already, you're automatically giving an improvement, right? So that's going to be part of the benefit that they see. Anytime you lose weight, if you're obese or overweight, that seems to improve endotoxemia. Um, anything else like you take metformin, one of the best things that metformin does is improve the integrity of the gut lining, uh, reduces uh, the amount of sort of signal you get um, from from the, um, the receptors that that measure or respond to endotoxin, and also it shifts the gut microbiome. So one of the reasons metformin works really well is because it actually fixes what's going on in your gut. In general, particularly people with metabolic disease, obesity, insulin resistance, they, they have a reduced microbial diversity. It makes me think of this really nice paper, uh, Li Ping Zhao, you've interviewed yeah, him, in fact, amazing. remember. So 35% of this guy's gut bacteria were um, Enterobacter cloacae, which is a really sort of inflammatory proteobacter. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's obviously a case, a case of really severely reduced diversity. Um, but we often see, and people who come to us on a ketogenic diet, and we've even worked with some of the big names in, in the keto world, and you sort of look at what's going on in the, in the gut, and it's just crickets, right? Mm. There's just nothing going on in there. Wow. There's sort of all the bacterial counts are low. Um, and then, you know, it's just not surprising that maybe their metabolic health isn't as good as they want it to be. Mm -hmm. So actually some people who've really struggled on keto, I've taken them exactly the other way. So really low fat, like plant-based vegan, because you're just forced to eat so many and so like varied plants mm. that you can sort of like force a shift in the gut microbiome. And actually it has similar benefits on metabolic health. You just have to, it's just hard, it's mm. hard work, yeah. right? So then you can sort of, I think you can sort of like force a shift in the microbiome. A lot of these people then feel a lot better and then you can maybe transition back to more of a low carb style if that's what you want to do. If protein intake is adequate, I think you can probably, and probably frequent enough too. So often if people are restricting their, restricting their eating window 
and reducing protein intake and reducing carbohydrate intake, I think all of those together are definitely going to potentially cause issues in terms of muscle growth. Mm -hmm. We know that if people are on a ketogenic diet, often they're just less hungry. And when I've been strict keto, like I, I've really struggled to maintain mass myself. I did exactly the same thing. Uh, just because I wasn't hungry. I just yeah. couldn't face eating the calories I needed to eat. So um, if you can find a way to get enough protein, then it's probably not going to be an issue, but you might need to like expand, expand the eating window, make sure you're getting, you know, you're not getting longer breakdown times. It's also going to depend on the intensity of your workouts and how well you fuel around them. But I think it's possible, yeah. but maybe not. If you're, if you're, but again, when people are talking about, talking about, you know, building muscle and worrying about their diet, the most important thing is getting into the gym and doing the right training at the right time and then recovering from it. And so everybody's worried about whatever supplement or how many protein shakes or like, in reality, that stuff doesn't matter because mm. what really matters is consistency and training, making sure you're getting the right stimulus. And then if you have enough protein intake around that, you can probably get most of the way there. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, Frank Zane, Arnold Schwarzenegger, they didn't have all these pills and potions yeah. <laughs> that we yeah, do exactly. now, right?